to introduce then our guest speaker, uh, Mr. Tim Gallel, who, as I said, is the head of the Army History Unit. And we're very much looking forward to hearing from you today, Tim. But may I, just as we begin, come in. Thank you. Mr. Grimley and others from Miranda, great to see you. Uh, so, Tim, prior to taking up the position as the head of the Australian Army History Unit in 2017, uh, he was an Australian regular Army officer who had a 30-year career, including deployments to Afghanistan and Kuwait in support of Australian Special Operations Task Groups, and also postings as the commanding officer of the Australian Defence Force School of Languages, of which he is a graduate, and as a defence attaché and student in Japan. As I mentioned, that you might imagine some of the insights he's going to be sharing with us shortly. Uh, he holds a Master of Arts International Relations from Deakin University and is a graduate of the Australian Defence Force School of Languages, as I said, the Japan Brown Self-Defence Force Command and General Staff Course, and the Japan National Institute for Defence Studies. Tim is the author of uh, several articles. You may have read him in wartime just recently. And he has presented on Australian and Japanese military history and currently completing a manuscript focused on the Battle of Mill Bay. So we'll have our special insight uh, today from some of that which will appear in the book. As I said, he will uh, consider for us how Mill Bay was so vital to Japanese plans to seize Port Moresby and to isolate Australia. And I'd like you to join with me in welcoming uh, Tim Millell as our guest speaker. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. First of all, I'd like to, uh, to thank you for uh, providing me this opportunity to, uh, to address the uh, Battle for Australian Association of uh, New South Wales on the uh, Battle of Mill Bay. Uh, it's been uh, an issue that's uh, taken up a lot of my interest over about the last five or uh, six years. Uh, today I propose to, uh, to provide an overview of the battle and then to examine some key matters that have perhaps not been particularly well documented elsewhere. Um, I do need to put a bit of a rider out there, uh, and that is to say that the presentation is based on personal research that I've conducted in Australia, uh, in Japan, and at Mill Bay. Uh, and that was all prior to my appointment uh, in October last year when I joined the Australian Army History Unit. Uh, I like to say that for the last 20 years I've been a serial pest of the Australian Army History Unit. <laughs> uh, they finally relented and uh, let me in. Uh, while I'm confident of my research, uh, I am speaking from a very personal perspective, and my views do not necessarily uh, represent those of the Australian Army, the Department of Defence, or the Australian Government. And you might say, well, why is he saying that? And uh, that is to say that the book is not complete, so the manuscript is out for comment, uh, and it does present some, uh, some new information, which is different to what you will find in the official history that was produced in the, uh, the 1960s. Um, so if I apply hindsight, um, please forgive me, I'm not trying to diminish the achievement of the Australian and the American servicemen uh, who were at Mill Bay. Today's researcher uh, has access to Japanese uh, records, including the post-battle uh, report. The Japanese wanted to know why they lost. So they interrogated I, I don't think it would be really true. Uh, having read the descriptions to say interviews, they more or less interrogated the survivors and said, what happened? How did this happen? Uh, and that report is actually available on the internet, but it's, it's kind of hidden. It's, it's a bit hard to find. Um, so today's researcher has access to that sort of record. We have access to, uh, to records and diaries that are at the Australian War Memorial, and some of those have been uh, used previously. We also have access to uh, published memoirs from, uh, from Japan. I say we. It helps me read Japanese. Uh, it helps the government spend a lot of money teaching me to read Japanese. Uh, so I actually see this as a, as a bit of an affirmation, uh, it's a bit of a return, I hope, on the investment that the, uh, the Commonwealth has put in my education. The key thing is that information allows me to see things that people on the ground in 1942, 1945, the 50s and 60s could. I had access to information that could only have dreamed of. So if I'm applying hindsight, it's because I have had the benefit of that education and I have had the benefit of the access to the material that people just could not have had, uh, particularly while the battle was actually occurring. And I should stress too that the Allied victory at Milne Bay was not inevitable. I've used the term, the tide turned, but that's not to say it's passive, it's not to say it's some natural event. 
where it was just going to happen one day that the, uh, the, the Japanese advance would stop. That's not the case. It's actually a quote, I'll, uh, or some manipulation of the quote, which I'll talk about later on, uh, from one of the participants of the battle. But also, uh, I absolutely adore this photograph. I'm told you shouldn't use photographs that don't have faces of people in it, because everyone's facing away from the camera. But this photograph represents to me the high tide, the high tide mark of the Japanese advance. And nothing speaks to the nature of the Battle of Bill Bay, to my mind, as much as this photograph. You can see the Japanese tanks, you can see where they have stopped. You can see that they are blocked. You can see that there is mud, and you can see the Australians are advancing past them. And when I say Australians, I say the Allied victory. I also have to stress that this was as much a US victory as it was an Australian victory. Australians provided most of the combatants, but a key component, of course, in this battle is the application of air power, and that was only possible because the airfields had been built by US engineers. The Australians did not have the capacity, particularly the heavy machinery, to clear two kilometre long, 170 metre wide strips through the jungle. Couldn't have been done, couldn't have been done in the time available uh, without the presence of US engineers. Without those engineers, the airfields wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been built. Without the airfields, the Royal Australian Air Force wouldn't have been there. Without the Royal Australian Air Force, I'm pretty confident the battle wouldn't have been won. Now, I should also say, my background as an Army officer, uh, now working with the Australian Army history in it, if there's a heavy Army focus on this, you know, I think you'll probably forgive me. I'm pleased I want to acknowledge up front, particularly uh, the Air Force contribution, but I do have a slide to talk about the, uh, the Navy as well. <laughs> <laughs> someone talking about Napoleon. <laughs> <laughs> this is no exception. So Napoleon once said that in war, the moral is to the physical as the Greek is to one. So it's with these caveats in mind, I'd like to speak about the Battle of Mill Bay, how it unfolded, and how the Allied victory there shattered the myth of Japanese invincibility. By August 1942, Japanese forces had been in New Guinea for about five months. After capturing Rabaul, Kavien, in, and, and Kavien in January, and then laying a nearby Salamara in March, Port Moresby was identified as the next joint objective. But US Navy aircraft carrier raids confirmed the Japanese Army's fears about the vulnerability of conducting an amphibious operation against Port Moresby. So the landing was postponed until such time as Japanese aircraft carriers could be made available to protect the Japanese invasion convoy. The invasion of Port Moresby plan considered three options. The China Strait offered the shortest route. The transits would be vulnerable to attack while navigating these narrow waters. And what I should say too, because there is a Navy officer in the room, is Army officers always think in maps. And we think that all that blue area out there is navigable. I'm going to do a terrible thing, I'm going to point at the map. It's a series of reefs that come out this way. They come out all the way to, uh, to this group of islands out here. It's called the Lavisier Archipelago. And to an Army officer, we just expect, I'm sorry, Paul, we expect the Navy just to be able to use all that area. In fact, there's only three passageways, and this is the first one, this is the one that's closest. The second option that was considered was to sail all the way around the east of the Louisiana Archipelago. But that would double the amount of time that the Japanese invasion convoy would be vulnerable to Allied air attack from bases in northern Australia. I'm thinking Cooktown and, uh, and uh, Townsville in particular. So this left the central route, the Jamaat Passage, as the best route. As the convoy would be exposed in the Coral Sea for about 12 hours, Success would rely upon securing local air and sea superiority. So the Japanese planned that two of their aircraft carriers would sweep around the Solomon Islands to protect their flank. So I pointed the map again, the aircraft carriers were meant to be coming around this way. But the Japanese didn't expect that two US Navy aircraft carriers would be present. 
they have been warned, uh, forewarned by signals intelligence. Over the course of five days, the Battle of the Coral Sea took place. Heavy aircraft losses forced the Japanese aircraft carriers to withdraw, and the planned Port Moresby landing was again postponed. Thwarted by sea, the Japanese Army planned to take Port Moresby overland via the Kokoda Trail. And they would do this by establishing a beachhead at Buna. Logistics would be their biggest challenge. Anything that could not be carried by man would have to be brought to Port Moresby by sea. And that meant securing the China Strait was critical to the success of the Kokoda operation. Meanwhile, the Japanese landed, uh, Navy landed small forces in the Central Solomons and commenced building an airfield on the <coughs> island. So if the Japanese had recognised the importance of the China Strait, so had the Allies. The newly appointed Supreme Commander, South West Pacific, General Douglas MacArthur, directed his staff to find a suitable location for an airfield, which he would then use to support an offensive to retake Rabaul. They settled on Mill Bay at New Guinea's eastern tip. In MacArthur's words, with Mill Bay in Australian hands, the east flank of Port Moresby would be secure. At Rabaul, orders from Tokyo had been received, and they called for a combined Japanese Army and Navy landing near Port Moresby to support the advance over the Kokoda Trail. For that landing, the Japanese Navy would need to secure the China Strait. Japanese Air reconnaissance had, by late May, identified Mill Bay as the site where they would like to establish an airfield. But as a first step, the Japanese Navy planned to establish a seaplane base at a place called Samurai Island, not, not Samurai, Samurai, it's a public, public word. And, uh, I should have asked him, I've been to Mill Bay, I think there's a couple. Yep, fantastic. I don't know if you've ever got to China Strait. I haven't been to Samurai, but apparently it's a, it's a very picturesque little island. So they were going to establish a seaplane base there to provide some local air cover while their ships went through that very narrow uh, China Strait. But for the Japanese, the presence of the Allied garrison at Mill Bay was completely unknown until the 4th of August, when a Japanese aerial reconnaissance flight reported 30 Allied aircraft were there at an airfield they hadn't seen before. Meanwhile, the Japanese army was beginning to recognise its limits. Units that were going to advance over the Kokoda Trail had been stripped back to the bare minimum. This was to try and make the crossing over the Kokoda Trail easier for the troops who had to carry everything with them. But without a secure sea route to resupply them if they reached Port Moresby, it would not be possible to bring vehicles and fuel and ammunition that they would need to establish an airbase there in Port Moresby. So without Samurai Island, without the China Strait, and therefore without Mill Bay, the Japanese army advance over the Owen Stanleys would ultimately be meaningless. The Navy planned to suppress the Allied air base at Mill Bay using bombers, and they planned their airstrike for the 7th of August. But that morning, US Marines, and I know we have one here with us today, US Marines landed at Guadalcanal Island in the Solomons, and that forced the Japanese to redirect their bombers to the east rather than towards Mumbai. At the same time, as the Japanese Army continued to advance over the Kokoda Trail, that put pressure on the Japanese Navy. Every step the Japanese Army took closer to Port Moresby made the Navy's mission, the Japanese Navy's mission of securing China Strait, more important. So on the 12th of August, the Japanese Navy issued orders for the capture of Mill Bay. So at around 36 kilometres long and some 11 kilometres wide, Mill Bay is a fine natural harbour. It's ringed by high, high mountains, and fast-flowing creeks and rivers empty the region's annual 2.5 metre rainfall into the bay. In good weather, the narrow government track that ringed the bay's western end was trafficable. But torrential rains throughout August had left it all but impassable to four-wheel drive vehicles. Even tracked Brent gun carriers became hopelessly bogged. 
knee deep mud, exhausted marching troops, and sucked their boots from their feet. At the bay's western end, US and Australian engineers had commenced construction of three airfields. That started in June. When Brigadier John Field's 7th Brigade arrived, these men too were put onto labouring tasks. That undermined their ability to prepare defences and train in the unfamiliar environment. I'd just like to dwell on the 7th Brigade for a moment. It had uh, three battalions, it was comprised of militiamen who were probably be aware uh, under the, uh, the Service Act at the time were liable for service in Australian Territory and Papua was considered uh, Australian Territory at the time. Those three battalions, uh, as eventually happened, were all Queensland battalions, the 9th, the 25th, and the 61st. Uh, the 61st uh, had associations uh, through its uh, pre war militia days uh, and affiliations with the Scottish Regiment, which was known as the, uh, the Cameron Highlanders. On the 21st of July, Number 1 Strip was declared ready. And within days, the Royal Australian Air Force Number 75 and Number 76 squadrons, which were equipped with P 40 Kitty Hawks, had arrived. And they were joined by a handful of Hudson bombers from Number 6 and Number 32 squadrons. Later, uh, sorry, mid August, uh, Brigadier General, uh, sorry, Brigadier George Wooden's 18th Brigade arrived, and they were AIF troops that come from the Middle East. Three battalions there, the 2nd and 9th uh, Queenslanders, 2nd and 10th, which was South Australians primarily, 2nd and 12th, which is uh, uh, Tasmanians, rounding up with uh, a few uh, Queenslanders. So an awful lot of Queenslanders in this battle. On the 22nd of August, Major General Cyril Clowes, and there is a debate whether it's Clowes or Clowes, and uh, we've gone as far as looking up everyone in the Defence Force telephone directory who's got that name and saying, hello. <laughs> <laughs> and so far we're 50 50 Clowes and Clowes. <laughs> Silent Cyril. He assumed command of all of North Force. His plan was to use Brigadier General Field's less experienced 7th Brigade as the Forward Brigade, and that would be tasked with defending the, the, uh, the bay. Meanwhile, Brigadier Wooden's 18th Brigade would be the Rear Brigade, and that would be tasked with countering any Japanese attack. So, what I've got there is to the left, the 18th Brigade, uh, as a more or less uh, the location of all three battalions. There were some sub elements uh, spread across the, uh, uh, to the north. But you'll see out to the right the individual battalions of the militia, 7th Brigade, uh, indicated there as the 25th, the 9th, and the 61st, they're the main positions. All right, now it's time to talk about Japanese plans. So the Japanese commanded this operation as a naval officer. All the forces, air, sea, and ground in this operation for the Japanese side from the Japanese Navy. There's no Japanese Army troops in this battle whatsoever. Hands up if you've actually made that mistake when you wrote an article in your time about 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so the Japanese commander is a naval officer, Commander Hashi. His orders were to land near Rabi on the night of the 25th, 26th August and seize the airfield. So he's coming in from the east. Uh, from the south, on the southern, uh, uh, sorry, into the bay itself, and, and, and landing on the northern coast of the, uh, of the bay. He had 612 men with him, and they were organised into his headquarters and two naval infantry companies. They were supported by two light tanks. Also accompanying him were 228 men who operated landing craft, so a naval logistics unit, and 362 mostly unarmed Korean and Taiwanese labourers. Hayashi would also be supported by Commander Skiorga's. 350 men, they were to move by landing craft from Buna to Taupota and cross the Stirling Range to outflank the Japanese, uh, sorry, Australian defences from the north. So this shows uh, Skelga's uh, land route. He's meant to do it over three days in uh, open top landing craft, uh, resting up overnight uh, on, the, uh, on the shore and coming in and attack basically to outflank these range as I said. But on the afternoon of the 24th of August, uh, coast watchers, naval coast watchers, who all Australian naval officers, <laughs> spotted Skiokas force near Paul or Harbour. The next day, nine number 75 squadron Kitty Hawks attacked. They attacked Skiokas landing craft where they had stopped to make 
much on good enough Island. As a result of the, uh, that attack, all seven barges were left waiting, and a column of smoke rising a thousand feet into the air could be seen by the Australian pilots. Unfortunately for Commander Hayashi, he was unaware that Skioka's men were now stranded on Wigmouth Island and would not be able to join them in the battle. This is a... Uh, that's interesting. <laughs> I don't know where Amy is. So we'll just go and close and see what happens there. There we go. Okay, so Commander uh, Hayashi's force entered Hill Bay uh, a few hours before midnight on the 25th. Heavy cloud and sea mist made it difficult to identify the intended landing point. <coughs> Not long after landing, the Japanese chased down two small boats. These boats were withdrawing D Company from the 1st <coughs> Battalion from their outpost at Ayama. I know it says Ahiyama, but apparently it's pronounced Ayama. One of those boats, the Lagar Bronzewing, was forced aground and three Australians were captured. The Australian prisoners were interrogated and they told the Japanese that the airstrip was protected by around 1,500 troops and reinforcements had arrived only a week earlier. This is the second bit of bad luck for the Japanese. The first one is the old people stranded, doesn't get, can't join them from the north. The second one is, when you go through the details of the Japanese planning, they actually never identified the size of the Australian garrison. If you don't know what you're up against, then you know you've got enough troops to actually fight the battle. There was some more bad news for the Japanese. The quartermaster came ashore, he was met by a junior officer, who apologised and said to him, It seems we've landed on the wrong beach. The Japanese ships had actually pulled up more than 10 kilometres short of their intended objective. They actually decided to push on towards the airfield regardless and he hoped to seize it uh, before sunrise. I've gone the wrong way now, I? There we go. After marching four kilometres, his column contacted Lieutenant Bird Robinson's 14-man standing patrol at Cameron Springs. The sentry, the Australian sentry, Private Wally Whitman, was shot as he challenged Japanese figures in the darkness. In response, Robinson's men opened up, killing four Japanese and wounding a further 15. Robinson then conducted a fighting withdrawal back towards Big Company's main position at a place called KB Mission. Even with support from his tanks, Hayashi found the Australian line a tough nut to crack. In a series of engagements, he forced the Australians back to a place to a position along the Yako Ekonai Creek by around about 0500 hours that morning. As daylight approached, Commander Hayashi sent two situation reports back to Rabaul, and he apologised for not capturing the airfield. That change in plan forced other changes in the Japanese plan. Unloading operations of the transport ships was suspended around about 30 minutes before sunrise, and that was to allow the Japanese transport ships enough time to depart the bay in darkness. As they left, the ships were attacked by eight US B-17 bombers. None of the Japanese ships were seriously damaged, but more bombers arrived and dropped their loads on the Japanese beachhead. However, it was the Royal Australian Air Force fighters that did most of the damage that unhinged Japanese planes. A series of Kitty Hawk strikes throughout the morning sank or set afire all 12 Japanese landing craft. First to be hit, were two landing craft that were carrying 250 kilogram bombs. Remember the Japanese wanted to set up an air base here, so they're carrying aircraft bombs. Those bombs cooked off. And they set fire to aviation fuel that was being carried in other uh, landing craft, creating a veritable sea of fire. Number 75 squadron alone undertook 39 sorties that day. And so 39 attacks with probably around about 14 or maybe 12 operational aircraft, so flying multiple sorties. Now the 76 Squadron maintained a similar strike rate and expended a total of approximately 35,000 rounds of 50 caliber ammunition. Often these sorties were conducted so quickly that the Kitty Hawk's gun barrels were still emitting wisps of smoke as they landed back at number one strip. At the 
front line, the Japanese tried it successfully to push forward during breaks in the air attacks. Opposite them was B Company, led by Captain Bix. They occupied defensive positions along the Echo Ekonai Creek. As the morning wore on, it seemed likely the Japanese had withdrawn, so an Australian patrol was dispatched to investigate. They advanced a few hundred metres to a position near the Wadu Wadu Creek before they were repulsed. Despite this setback, setback Captain Bix was ordered to push on, just in case enemy landing uh, reinforcements arrived that night. By now, Bix had been reinforced with two more companies from the 61st Battalion and one company from the 25th Battalion. It gave them a total of four companies. That's normally a lieutenant colonel's responsibility, not captains. Bix was a newly promoted captain. But he would prove to be a commensurate combat leader. In the late afternoon, the Australian artillery fired 140 high explosive rounds in an eight minute barrage. Fifteen minutes later, airstrikes dropped anti personnel bombs 300 yards in front of Bix's line. They were followed by seven Kitty Hawks conducting strafing runs. And advancing astride the government track, Bix intended to reach the high ground of the Cameron Plateau that overlooked Mill Bay and Cape Mission. His men crossed the Echo Econi Creek in the heavy rain, and although they advanced around 800 yards, they could not press the attack any further. So he's aiming for this area up here in the Cameron Plateau. Maps are deceptive. You really can't move for those who have been at Mill Bay more than a few metres from maybe about 100 metres off the, uh, off the coastline before you just get into thick vegetation. Yes, if you can't walk through, you can't conduct operations. The Australians have now come up against the Japanese defensive line, and with darkness approaching, Bix broke off the attack and withdrew to the Motio Creek. His counterattack had proved too ambitious, but the Australians now knew they were facing a strong force. Nevertheless, the militia soldiers had proved they did not lack aggression, and their attack contributed to Hayashi's caution that night. From the air attacks during the day, Hayashi knew that the airfield remained operational. His men were tired and had suffered many casualties. Half of his platoon commanders by this stage were killed or wounded. Further adding to his concerns, Hayashi was informed that all his supplies had been destroyed in the air raids at the beach end, and he had not received any word from Commander Skioka. But if they had landed, as had been planned, he was obliged to continue his attacks. In his favour, Commander Hayashi could rely upon his two tanks, and this is one of them restored at the other uh, war memorial, we're putting the back end of it here, but uh, it's probably one of the best colour shots that's available. And he also had some flamethrowers. And he could also use the cover of darkness to protect his troops from observation and attack by allied aircraft. The attack did not proceed as Hayashi had wished. He pressed some puddle wings into service to act as guides, but they led him down an inland route. His men struggled on through the thick vegetation for six hours. When they rejoined the road, they found they hadn't advanced more than one kilometre from their start point. Frustrated, he cancelled the night's attack. But as often happens, two of his platoons didn't get the order, and they continued to advance along the coast. <laughs> I swear I didn't do anything. <laughs> so two of his platoons didn't get the order, and around about 2200 hours they fell on the Australian main line. Uh, which was held by the main strength of the 61st Battalion, still under Captain Bix's command. Uh, Bix was determined to conduct an active defence. He deployed one of his companies across the creek to meet the advancing Japanese. The Japanese attacks continued, and although the tanks were not participating in this uh, aspect of the battle, one of the flamethrowers uh, uh, came into action. Now, if you can imagine, your Bay is pitch black at night, and when somebody uses a flamethrower, everyone on the battlefield sees it. The Japanese flamethrower elicited from the Australians a ferocious response. <laughs> it was quickly silenced with a shower of hand grenades. But Australian casualties began to mount, and at around 0400 hours, the Japanese sailors started to work around the flanks, including wading out into the bay to try and get around the Australian position. Bix decided to pull back to the next river. A patrol dispatched to cover his withdrawal reported the Japanese had also withdrawn. But for two nights, Captain Bix's aggressive employment 
of the militia companies had frustrated the Japanese advance. When the three companies from the 61st Battalion returned to the unit lines, the combined strength of soldiers who were ready for combat totaled only 82 men. They probably started with just over 200, uh, quite on strength, but they probably started with over 200. Most of them were dead, they were wounded, they were exhausted, they hadn't eaten, they were suffering in some cases from malaria, some had become lost in the darkness as well. As the first units to engage the Japanese landing forces, the militia force or the militiamen had proven their mettle. Despite being undertrained and facing an enemy that was at least equal in number but was equipped with tanks and with flamethrowers, these Queenslanders had lived up to the 61st Battalion's boast. Uh, Cameron never yields. <coughs> the next morning was the, uh, the 27th, and uh, some Japanese aircraft arrived over the, uh, the battle, uh, over the Bay for, for the first time for a matter of days. This included seven Zero fighters and eight Bell dive bombers. Their air raid turned out to be a disaster for the, uh, the Japanese airmen. They lost two dive bombers and four fighters. The losses were not entirely one sided. Uh, number 76 Squadron uh, lost its commander that day, Squadron Leader Peter Turnbull. He had uh, dived to attack Japanese troops on the ground when his aircraft suddenly flipped over onto its back and crashed. Before taking off, Turnbull had prophetically quipped to one of his, uh, uh, to his, uh, to his men, Well boys, if I don't come back, tell my mum my last words were stuff the air back. <laughs> Commander number 76 squadron then passed to a squadron leader Blue and Trust I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's a, uh, yeah. what he, uh, quite, a, uh, quite a famous figure in uniforms. And much loved by the army too, actually. Um, meanwhile, below them, the 2nd and 10th Battalion, this is now 8th Battalion, was advancing to relieve the 61st Battalion. Much was expected from these veterans. They were veterans of the Tobruk siege. However, the newly arrived 2nd 10th had not acclimatised the environment and they had not adapted to the needs of jungle warfare. Several, uh, several factors shaped what happened next. First of all, the AIF veterans were dismissive of the militiamen. That meant in turn they were, they were underestimating the Japanese. Second factor was that planning for the 2nd 10th battalion's advance was confused and ignored the reality of the terrain. Third, a decision was made to lighten the men's loads so they could move through the thick vegetation. And that meant leaving most of their heavy, heavy weapons, including their red guns, behind. And in a decision that was much later regretted, the anti-tank weapons, including anti-tank rifles, and these were 14 kilograms of about 30, 32, 34 pound weapons, and poison tank rifles were left behind. And in their place they took jelly uh, knife bombs called sticky bombs. The name sticky is important. The 2nd 10th Battalion advanced to KV Mission shortly before sunset and organised a hasty defence. Contact came at 1930 hours as Hayashi's two tanks manoeuvred without headlights on the perimeter. Over the next three hours, the tanks drove a wedge into the Australians' defences. The Australians counterattacked with one of the three inch mortars they'd taken with them and they claimed to hit on the tank, but the tank didn't stop. To make matters worse, the sticky bombs didn't. <laughs> they malfunctioned, or they simply bounced off the tanks. At 21.30 hours, a tank overran the sea company, and battalion headquarters came under fire. The commanding officer faced the inevitable and ordered the battalion to withdraw. By around 2.15 hours, 60 Australians had formed a thin line at a river behind Cody Mission called the Gama River, there was a narrow ford there. They had with them one, one enemy tank rifle which had been brought up. When the Japanese tanks appeared around about 2.30 in the morning, Corporal John O'Brien used the anti tank rifle to fire three rounds at around about 15 yards range. It's pretty close. I don't like being within 15 yards of a tank. Uh, and what we can say from the Japanese record is that and what O'Brien didn't realise at the time, because he was certainly uh, interviewed afterwards, he thought he missed the tanks. Now, how can he miss a tank at 15 yards? Well, it's pitch black. Absolute pitch black. What he didn't realise was he actually shot 
I believe he shot uh, seven to nine acres of dry land in the The Japanese records indicate seven to nine died at that point. They can't, the Japanese can't ascribe it to a particular uh, uh, weapon. But one of the, uh, the aspects of the uh, fighting in the darkness was the Japanese tanks have a very big hatch in the front around about this big. And also with a thin vision slit, so they can close that hatch and they can see through the slim vision here. Uh, 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 slit. But in the darkness, my guess is they probably had that big driver's hatch open so they could see where it's going. So I have no doubt that that's something we have learned from the Japanese record that O'Brien probably actually shot the driver. And this is to have some catastrophic uh, effects for the Japanese later on. Nevertheless, the Japanese pushed on. They pushed the Australians off the opposite bank, and in the space of seven hours, that veteran battalion, the second, the second tenth battalion, had been forced out of the fight. And I don't think anyone expected that. That was really quite a shock to General Pales and the state. As the Japanese continued around the bay, they faced the first of six platoons from the 25th battalion, which had deployed along the bay, along the track, uh, behind the, uh, the second tenth. Unknown to the Australians, Commander Hayashi's tanks had bogged down. And they bogged down. I can't help myself. Sorry. <laughs> if you go back to that photograph, if you go back to the photograph of the two tanks positioned like this, the driver of the lead tank had been killed. That happened at the Gama River. The point where the two tanks get bogged is 200 metres past the uh, Bagama River. And so what happened here was the driver of the lead tank gets killed. Very narrow track, you might recall from the photograph. One tank can't overtake, can't overtake the other tank. So you're stuck in that formation. You go up to another sailor and they say, you're now the driver of the lead tank. Thanks. <laughs> He goes about 200 metres, and in the darkness, so you can imagine the pressure on him, in the darkness, he veers off to the right. And when he veers off to the right, the tank bellies out, the tracks are running in the air, digging the, the, uh, the tank deeper into the mud. The tank coming behind him doesn't want to crash into him, knows there's a problem to the right, so what does he do? He drives to the left. Um, if I'm going to apply a hindsight, it's going to be here. What he might have done was stop his tank. He veered off to the left, the two tanks become blocked. But the Australians do not know this. So as far as they're concerned, all the Australians, still further to the west, are... Uh, I better get the right one. Thank you. Sergeants that didn't have uh, officers as their platoon commanders. The RSM was there. 
Uh, and there is a story that the RSM uh, might have been threatening the Australians with his pistol as much as he was threatening the Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> they hold off the Japanese for a matter of hours just before sunset, uh, sunrise, and with sunrise, the Japanese go back into the, uh, the pattern they've established of hiding back in the tour, falling back into the jungle to avoid air attacks. The two sergeants um, both later received military medals. RSM uh, is doing what an RSM is expected to do. He doesn't receive a military medal, he gets an engine and dispatches. Okay. okay, so this then uh, takes us to really one of the climaxes of uh, the whole battle, and this is the fight for number three scoop. On the night of 29 to 30 August, reinforcements had landed. These were 576 men, Japanese reinforcements under Commander Yano, reinforced by another 200 men under Sub Lieutenant Doshioka. The Japanese are throwing in naval troops from different units by this stage. Commander Yano and Commander Hayashi are both at the same level, so Hayashi's been there for a few days, Commander Yano's both arrived. They're actually classmates from the Naval Academy, and they're having a bit of a discussion about who's in charge. <laughs> Eventually they agree that they should resume the attack, uh, but they won't resume the attack that night of 29, 30 August, they'll lay up during the day, and then they will advance against the uh, what they believe to be the airstrip, they actually believe number three airstrip here, which is later named Turnbull Field after Squadron uh, Leader Turnbull, who crashed a few days earlier. They believe this is the operational airstrip, but in fact, all the Air Force flies are over another strip about three or four kilometers away over here in number one city. Japanese don't know that. I'll watch the graphic later on and explain why they don't know that. Okay. So they agree they're going to attack on the night of the 30th, 31st. Uh, during the day, the Australians were not happy to uh, be passive. His name comes up again. Captain Bix decides to lead a patrol way. I should say Bix has later awarded the Distinguished Service uh, Order for uh, his conduct in this battle. Not bad for a temporary captain. Not bad for a man who was told he was too old to join the ARF. Uh, not bad for a militia in his first battle. And I'll talk a little bit later. Not bad with a uh, unit that's thoroughly around the train as a militia for this uh, for the sort of fighting going to take uh, As you can see, I'm a fan of that, Captain Bix. He takes a patrol out, and uh, first of all, he comes across a Japanese field hospital. And at the hospital were a series of uh, Japanese bodies, and there were five, uh, sorry, I think it was five. And each of, them been, uh, each of the, uh, the soldiers in this uh, field hospital, sailors, I should say, so they been killed by a single shot to the heart. <coughs> so that they wouldn't become a burden to the unit. They've been uh, put to death by their own medical staff. That's pretty shocking. <coughs> As Bix goes a little bit further to the east, uh, he comes across the body of some puppets and uh, finds that they've been killed and, uh, and uh, quite really treated before they were killed. As he goes further to the east, he finds some Australian soldiers have been captured. They too have been killed and they have uh, too been brutal and treated. So what this tells you is that here is evidence of a, a ruthless enemy, an enemy who will neither give nor seek a quarter. At dusk, Japanese force decided to renew its attack, this is on the 30th, 31st, and set out along the track. Hayashi's men led the way, so the soldiers have been, the sailors have been there longest lead the way, and the reinforcements followed behind them. But in the darkness, and the heavy rain, and I think anyone who uh, ever writes about the battle of Mumbai, anyone who was there during the battle, only ever talks about the rain and the mud. Uh, that's the first enemy, whether, whether you're on the Japanese side or whether you're on the Australian side, uh, or the Allied side, I should say. Um, the first enemy is the rain in the mud, it was relentless. So in that darkness, the Japanese column splits, and more than half of, of uh, Commander Yano's men, the reinforcements become hopelessly lost, don't play any uh, part in the, in the battle that night. In their way lay number three strip. It's a perfect killing ground. It's a 70 metre wide landing strip. It's got a cleared perimeter that extends to the Sago swamps at the southeast end, all the way back to the vegetation of the hills at its northwestern end. The strip's western end had been uh, bulldozed, bulldozed through a coconut plantation. And the debris from, uh, from that coconut plantation is piled up on either side of the airstrip into a, a, just a pile of uh, trees and, and, uh, and soil. It's about eight feet high. So imagine eight feet high ramparts on either side of this two kilometer long, 70 metre wide air, airfield. Australians had also run a strip of barbed wire right down the centre of the, uh, the airfield to make it a better obstacle. And two battalions, the 61st and the 25th, are now defending the airfield. And you notice 
but the, uh, the 61st actually spans the airfield and it's got forces on, the, on both sides. And that's because there's a ridge line just here that runs parallel to the run lines called Stevens Ridge, whereas this side is actually quite flat. Those two battalions had between them, even though they're in a bit of a depleted state, probably more forces than the Japanese actually were able to bring into this attack, particularly because half of the Japanese reinforcements were lost during the night. And the Australians are reinforced, they're reinforced with US engineer um, troops who've got half tracks with 50 calibre machine guns on them. It's also Australian Vickers machine guns. Um, they've got a very heavy weapon, not one you want to carry around with you, but perfectly suited, uh, suited to the defence of an airfield like this. Further thickening those defences are three inch mortars. Further thickening those defences are uh, eight to 25 pounder guns from the uh, uh, second, fifth regiment, uh, the ninth battery. So, Kamala Hayashi uh, leads the attack. He's been there uh, again, uh, that was me. He leads the attack. His men have uh, trudged through the mud for about six or seven kilometres in the darkness. They come up against the, uh, the airfield and they come into this perfect killing ground. Three times they try and surge across the strip. Each time they were repulsed. Hayashi and his agent killed the attacks along with many of their men. Commander Yano, uh, the reinforcement commander, has one of his companies with him. And they also attack across the airstrip only to be forced back. The other force under Sub-Lieutenant Yoshioka unsuccessfully attempts to outflank the uh, Australian defences by attacking Stevens Ridge. But with the approach of dawn, bringing with it the threat of renewed air attacks, Yano abandons the attack, and not one Japanese sailor reaches the far side of the airstrip. So if I can give you, this is a different view of the airstrip. 25th Battalion, 61st Battalion, Japanese advancing from this area. This photograph is taken about, uh, about a month or two after the battle. But I think that by this stage the airstrip is largely complete. Uh, I think it's almost ready for operations. But you can see in the jungle where there's not a lot of places to actually shoot people, to see people, um, why it is that the Japanese have <coughs> stopped here. I mentioned about the two sergeants in the RSM. Their fighting took place down here. And again, you see there's a clearing here. Uh, and that's probably what gave them uh, a bit more of an advantage and a little bit more confidence too. They could actually see their enemy for the first time before their enemy were right on top of them. Okay, so confident the Japanese landing force had uh, been broken during the previous night attack, uh, General Clouds resumed the offensive with a plan that was only slightly different to the 2nd 10th Battalion's advance against KB Mission four days earlier. His orders were simple. The 18th Brigade will attack and destroy enemy forces on the North Shore of Mill Bay. Not more than one infantry battalion will be committed to this task. That was a force that was no stronger than the one that had been used to KB Mission. The battalion he chose to, uh, to lead this attack is the 2nd 12th May 8th Battalion. The following up behind them would be a militia battalion, the 9th Battalion, to secure the road as the, uh, as the 2nd 12th advances. Unlike the 2nd 10th Battalion, the 2nd 12th carried some of its uh, anti-tank rifles and all of its brain guns, so it lessened a bit of More importantly, they employed new tactical formations. They employed tactics at, at the platoon and company level that were better suited to fighting in the jungle. And on top of that, They've actually worked out a way to coordinate air and artillery support in the jungle uh, that, that hadn't actually been perfected in the early phases of the, uh, the battle. So they've got this protective umbrella sitting over the top of it. Initially, the 2nd 12th encountered very little organised resistance until D Company reached KB Mission. So D Company comes all that distance, about 4 or 5 kilometres, and it gets to KB Mission. Not all of the battalion makes it that far. And about half of the 2nd uh, Corps makes a uh, position, defensive position on the, uh, the Garden River. They go into camp for the night, or lager for the night, very tight perimeter, everyone's facing out, ready for the worst. And this is where the next significant action takes place. I've talked about the Japanese force that had tried to outflank on Stevens Ridge. Well, during the day, they withdrew, they withdrew into the jungle. Just around about sunrise on the uh, sorry sunset on the 31st, they emerged from the jungle. At this point, just next to the Australian uh, the, uh, the second tallest lager here at the Garden River. This is Yoshi, uh, Lieutenant Yoshioka's two hundred man company. Unsuspecting that the Australians lay in wait for them, the, the Japanese sailors were chatting loudly as they neared the Garden River forward. Again, the Australians initiate 
that had dropped to an ambush, a fierce firefight ensues, an intermittent and savage conflict that continued until the early hours of the morning. Again, three times the Japanese attacked the Australian mines, but the flanks of the Australian position are secure. They're anchored against the beach on one flank and against the river on the other. It's a bit hard to say, but around about 50 to 60 percent of Yoshioka's 200 men are killed that night. There's a bit of imprecision uh, in the Japanese system. If you're seen to be killed, that's confirmed as killed, and your family will get the insurance money that you have paid out of your salary. If you haven't been seen to be killed, you're missing in action, your family don't get the insurance money. Uh, very different way to the way that the Veterans Affairs works. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer our system. <laughs> Alright. So by now the Australians are confident they've got the Japanese on the run. And over the next five days, the 2nd 12th Battalion, and then followed by the 2nd 9th, pushed the Japanese back from one defensive line to another. Japanese radio communications this time contain some contradictory messages. On the one hand, there's talk of re further reinforcement. And Commander Yano, who's now the senior surviving uh, Japanese officer on the battlefield, is told to hold on. He's told he's got to, uh, to, to uh, continue to hold a, a toehold in uh, at Bill Bay. But the other contradiction is, at the same time, the landing force, Commander Yano's men, are actually sending signals saying, we think we should be evacuated. The mission has failed and uh, we think we should be withdrawn. It's quite unusual uh, for Japanese forces, particularly in that 1942. And although the Japanese do put up a stubborn defence, they're pushed back about a thousand metres uh, each day. On the 4th of September, the 2nd 9th Battalion, that's the 2nd 12th advance, on the 4th uh, of September, the 2nd 9th Battalion makes three attacks to clear the Japanese uh, along a, a river known as the Witten River. Whitman named after Private Molly Whitman, the uh, sentry who was killed on that first night. Three attacks are made by the Australian. In the second attack, Private Stanley Cross single handedly destroyed a Japanese machine gun position and was later awarded the military medal. And another man, Sergeant Roy Devantia, who was armed with a Thompson submachine gun, destroyed a party of five Japanese. He was also awarded a uh, military medal. But in the final display of courage that day, Corporal John Jack French single handedly attacked and defeated three Japanese machine gun positions before being found mortally wounded. One of the members of his battalion, Private Arthur Hins, uh, described how Johnny French had ordered us down and he went in and he got the first two posts, machine gun posts. And for the next one, he came back and he got a grenade off us and he finished off the other one. And that was the finish. When we advanced, Johnny was dead. French was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross for his heroism. But despite these acts of bravery, there was no prospect of forcing the Japanese from their positions before sunset. A patrol the next morning reported the Japanese had withdrawn. At 11.30 hours, the 2nd 9th Battalion uh, came into contact with the Japanese at the Aspi River. Again, the Japanese counter-attacked. For about five minutes, the two groups beat at each other, but the, the fighting concluded by 1700. Darkness restored quiet to the battlefield, uh, although the Australians saw some flares which they uh, used for target practice. Those flares have been used to signal Japanese warships in the bay that had come to evacuate the landing force. The Japanese Navy had been told they would have to evacuate about 500 people. That's how many survivors they thought the, uh, they were in the Japanese landing force. There were 931 survivors. And this is actually part of the Japanese reckoning and why they did this uh, in inquisition at the end to try and find out what went wrong. How can you lose a battle and have so many survivors? It just doesn't equate in the, uh, in the Japanese martial code. So summing up, Milmay's victory reflected effective and often inspirational leadership at all levels. It also reflects a mostly deliberate and cautious approach to overcoming uncertainty to defeat a determined opponent. General Klaus had secured the Australians' first clear victory over the Japanese on land. Over the course of 12 days, two Australian infantry brigades and two RAA fighter squadrons, supported for the first time by US Army engineers, 
and anti aircraft gunners, as well as US Army Air Force units operating from all ports in Australia, had defeated the Japanese Navy in a land battle. It's a bit hard to really get my head around that. How could you defeat a Navy in a land battle? And it was Brigadier Field who was uh, commanding the, uh, uh, the militia 7th Brigade. And Davis summed up the battle and he said, Such was the Battle of Milne Bay. Small in comparison to some of the sustained and desperate fighting which took place in the Pacific. Yet of fundamental importance to the Australian strategy in this result. It was the first Australian victory on land against the Japanese invader. And brought to a halt the long series of territorial gains which the enemy had seemed to achieve with relative ease. Henceforth, the tide was destined to turn. For the Japanese, the attack on Mill Bay was a disaster. More than 300 men were killed, and 300 missing. Losses amongst combat leaders were especially high, and in fact, only one of eight company commanders survived the battle. The Allies lost less than 200 dead, but not one of the 22 Australians who had been captured by the Japanese in the course of the battle survived. Many had been badly mutilated. 59 Papuans had also been killed and in many cases had been tortured or mutilated. Because their deaths occurred in Australian territory, Justice Sir William Webb was commissioned to investigate the war crimes. We should remember the Battle of Milne Bay for two key reasons. First, Milne Bay represented the high tide of the Japanese advance from Papua. In the eight months since the opening strike against Pearl Harbor, the Japanese advance had not been decisively stopped. Moreover, the desperate nature of the fighting, so close to mainland Australia, in a setting so hostile, and at the time so primitive, only heightened fears of the inevitability of further Japanese victories. Encountering the Japanese advance under such difficult circumstances, the Australians enhanced their reputation as reliable soldiers. The second point is that the Allied victory meant the Japanese Navy could not guarantee the security of the China Strait supply route. That supply route was needed for two things, for an amphibious landing against Fort Moresby and to resupply the Japanese forces that were coming over the, uh, the, the Kokoda Trail. Defeated Mill Bay frustrated both these aims and ultimately undermined the Japanese advance over the Kokoda Trail. Thus, the effects of the Battle of Mill Bay on what has become known as the Battle for Australia were both physical, they stopped the Japanese advance and they uh, removed the opportunity to use the China Strait for resupply, physical effects, and they were also moral. They proved that the Australian soldiers could fight, they could fight in Company Guinea that they could beat the Japanese, that the Japanese could be beaten. And that had, that, as I said at the beginning, was by no means illegal and no means uh, uh, expected at the time. So if I may, just a, a few points, uh, some points that I think that this is where it differs a little bit from uh, some, some of the records of the official history. We know how many Japanese forces landed we know how many Japanese forces landed because one of the documents they left behind was all of the nominal roles. They were dropped by the quartermaster, uh, who was also the paymaster. So very accurate nominal roles. They're held in the Australian War Memorial, but they weren't translated because they just weren't important at the time. The battle was over, it was finished. They're still there, um, almost right at the site the, uh, the, the serial number for them. But they tell us exactly how many Japanese troops landed how many sailors landed, how many weapons they carried, what their role was. And we know they were dropped by the quartermaster because the quartermaster is one of the few Japanese officers to survive and he writes his memoirs and he says, oh, when the Air Force attacked me, I was crossing a creek and I dropped this little container and it had all the pay records in it. So there's an issue with the quantity of the Australian soldiers, uh, sorry, the Japanese soldiers rather, and uh, sailors. And one of the other points I'd like to point out was there are only two tanks there was a bit of debate at the time whether there were three or four. Uh, you will see some contradictory things written on memorials. The Japanese records clearly indicate there were only ever two tanks. And we can actually identify the crewmen in those tanks. That's how I know Stephen Starbo was killed. I know what not Dave was killed. I can almost tell you where he was born. Not quite. There's an issue about the quality of the Japanese forces. Uh, 
They're equipped very similarly to the Japanese Army, which is part of the reason why people think the Army landed there. But they're not, nowhere near as well trained. It's not a Navy's core job to fight land battles. They have to do a lot of things very well. Um, what they call wrong. And these naval landing forces, when we, we uh, translate the title, they've been given this name Special Naval Landing Forces. And we hear special forces in our head. But it actually doesn't mean special, it means temporary, it means provisional. It means these forces are for a temporary land operation. They will secure a piece of territory and then they will become garrison troops. So they're not Marines. Here we go. So if I said the Japanese have a total of eight companies and one of them's um, stranded with a uh, kind of spionka up there on Wimba Highland, the Australians have 24 infantry companies and three Vickers machine gun companies. Now our companies are a little bit smaller, but we try and talk like for like when we talk about capabilities rather than numbers of soldiers or sailors. Australians also had some challenges. The militia brigade was rated at D uh, in July for the level of training, but it still was committed to the battle. It was still committed to Papua because they were the forces that were available to be sent into that area. That's a pretty big risk. The AIF battalions were rated at an A. So Captain Biggs and his troops, on this scale of A to F, are rated at D. And they're the first ones to actually stop the Japanese advance for those first two crucial nights uh, of the Battle of Little Bay. Another thing was the Australians weren't properly equipped, and they weren't properly trained. And I know that's probably said about a lot of conflicts, but uh, some of the sort of standouts here this is actually a, a, a scene from a uh, some stock footage or some film footage taken after the battle. This gentleman was actually doing his washing. And then he said, oh, I want to be in the film, I want Mum to see him okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it wasn't normal to go sort of Rambo style, shirtless, uh, on the But you can see they're wearing shorts, you can see they've got their sleeves rolled up. It's about two weeks later, the malaria casualties for this battle would just go through the roof. And Quite simply, the Australians weren't used to working in a malarial environment. The Japanese were also very badly affected by malaria. But, uh, you know, if I'd been there to take command, I, I would have been thoroughly, randomly sacked, kicked, uh, not kicked, um, counseled and admonished by my fighting officers <laughs> for putting troops in that sort of danger. But again, you can see the mark. What you can perhaps also see is they're wearing tan uniforms that stand out against the background. It's a couple of weeks later that the Australians start on the Kokoda Trail, about a week and a half later, and start dying in uniforms green. Um, unfortunately, some of the uh, army hierarchy at the time said, well, nonsense. The Japanese actually had the advantage of having green uniforms. Um, the Australians didn't. The Australians innovated, we took measures in their own hands, and dyed the green, the proper skin went green about a week after. <laughs> They didn't have four-wheel drive. They didn't have heavy engineering uh, equipment. And in fact, the bulldozer was actually uh, quite possibly uh, not Australian because we just didn't have many of them. Didn't have a lot of four-wheel drive vehicles. So if you've got a bulldozer in your bulk, you can imagine what's going to happen to a two-wheel drive truck that's got a few tons of stores on there. <coughs> um, interestingly enough, there was only one battery of Australian artillery there because artillery, senior artillery officers went there and said, you can't use artillery in the jungle. And they were kind of right first week, but the Australians came up with a method to get around that. And the method was, they said, if you bay, fill that water there. So aim for the water, drop the shells in the water, and then we'll tell you where to adjust from there. If you drop them in the water, you can't miss it. <laughs> <laughs> I can guarantee you won't hit our soldiers. You know, simple but brilliant. Uh, how do you guide aircraft onto a target in the jungle when you don't really have a map and you don't know where you are? We'll use the artillery, we'll drop around in the bay, we'll get the artillery we all wanted, then we'll drop around in the artillery smoke. Two columns of smoke will rise up. Then we'll drop another one over here, two columns of smoke. Pilots, line up those columns of smoke. That's your strafing line, that's your bombing line. Simple, crude, innovation, effective. All right. As I said, there were only two Japanese tanks. Notice this picture, the tank's still got its main armor. Um, that actually dates the photograph. This is very uh, shortly after the Australians had first discovered, about two days after the tanks had been they finally found the tanks. It's the Australians who actually removed this gun, and they need to remove the gun because the, the, 
we don't want the Japanese to, uh, to take the tank back. Um, they actually sabotaged the tank in there uh, uh, with some jelly life. Uh, but they removed the 37mm gun, and that's actually uh, about a full day um, operation for the uh, rating soldiers, so the chemical engineers. Two tanks have brought back to Australia, and they're experimented on. Uh, one of the rumours that came out was that the tanks had bulletproof lights, they didn't, uh, and that's later conclusively proven. And it's because they're brought back to Australia for experimentation that one of them ends up in the War Memorials collection today, and that's that brightly coloured, renovated uh, tank that you see. That's one of the tanks we've been But the critical thing is when you win a battle, you own the battlefield. So you get to keep everything that's left on the battle the diaries, the nominal roles, the tanks, the weapons. You get to exploit that for intelligent purposes. You get to understand your opposition, your enemy, in a way that you can't do when you're constantly uh, withdrawing and retreating and you don't retain a position of the battlefield. That's one of the uh, unsung stories of this battle, which is not only were the Japanese defeated, but the capture of equipment and records, prisoners, there's about uh, 14 Japanese taken prisoner uh, during this battle. The exploitation of the information that you can get from those prisoners, that you can get from the captured records, that you can get from the, uh, the captured records, that tells you that your enemy is not a superman. They're not some uh, unbeatable soldier. That helps you explain how they can be defeated. So that's one of the knock-on effects of the Battle of Hill Bay, is it provides the tangible evidence of weaknesses. Every army has them. Uh, in this case, the Japanese Navy troops, but it, every force has them and let you exploit them for further battles. That's one of the great gifts to the Allied war effort from winning the Battle of Mill Bay, is securing all that equipment and that knowledge, which then explains how the Japanese can be defeated and can be used in the future battles. The Air Force cannot be uh, praised well enough for this operation. It's the Air Force that attacked Commander Skioka and strand his force on Goodenough Island. All seven barges that he is using <coughs> are sunk or set on fire. They cannot participate in the battle. They cannot attack over the mountains from the north and outflank the Australians. Next day, when the Japanese land, uh, sorry, two days later, uh, when the Air Force attacks the Japanese landing force at Mill Bay, 12 landing craft. All 12 landing craft are sunk or set on fire. Seven, two days earlier, 12 that day, 19 for 19, <coughs> pretty impressive score. That strands the Japanese force. In fact, the landing craft uh, are so critically short that when the Japanese conduct the evacuation, they've only got two left to conduct the evacuation. Uh, I should say too that there was a lot of debate about whether the Air Force 75 and 76 Squadron aircraft should be withdrawn back to Port Moresby for their safety. And on one night they are. Uh, Louis Truscott, he doesn't go back to the planes, he stays at Mill Bay. I won't use the language that he used, uh, but he said, no, I'm not going. <laughs> <laughs> that caused a dip in the Australian soldiers' morale. When those aircraft came back the next day, morale went through the roof. The Air Force decision to stick it out at Mill Bay and to provide close support to the Australian uh, forces. The fact that they sank those barges, the fact that they could identify the Japanese landing force when it was coming in, that was, as acknowledged by General Carter himself, the decisive factor in this battle. Now, I should say, as you can see, there's some other Air Force units. The irony of this one is there were torpedoes. The Air Force had torpedoes at uh, Admiral Bay, but didn't have torpedo bombers. They arrived a day later. Uh, and that would have been very helpful because, had they been there earlier, because, find that. The naval presence in the region is small. Why? Because there isn't a lot of Navy, um, Australian Navy, Royal Australian Navy, or US Navy in the area. And most of it has actually been siphoned off to go and fight over in the Solomons at Model Canal. That leaves two Australian destroyers, and they're quite small. Uh, and if you compare what the Japanese have available, heavy cruisers, light cruisers, lots of destroyers. This leaves Australians with two destroyers to cover all of Papua New Guinea. And they just simply cannot be risked against this larger Japanese force. So what you see of that pattern of Japanese naval landing forces ashore attacking at night 
the drawings of the jungle, the safety of the jungle during the day, Australian aircraft attacking during the day, as a handover of control of the battlefield. But the night, the Japanese are the ones moving. The day, the Australians are the ones moving. At night, the Japanese ships are actually coming into the bay and shelling Australian positions. Not effectively, but they are shelling Australian positions. I can offer a counterpoint to, uh, to the, uh, the war crimes that occurred uh, against the captured Australians and against the, uh, the local Republicans. One night when the Japanese, or two nights in a row, the Japanese ships come into the bay and actually see an Australian hospital ship there. It's clearly marked, it's lit up in accordance with the, uh, the laws of war, the Geneva Convention, uh, and they decide not to shoot it. They do shoot at a supply ship, that's their game under the rules of war, but for two nights in a row the Japanese Navy do not fire a single shot against the sitting duck of a tiger of a hospital ship. That's really quite a contrast to the behaviour of, uh, of the forces ashore. But as you would have heard before, it's the role of the Coast Watchers which is really a key component. They're the ones who can provide information on ship movements which can then steer the Air Force in to conduct the strikes against those landing craft to the north in particular, that provide advance warning to the Australians and the Americans ashore of Japanese ship movements. And that gives the Australians another decisive uh, advantage. And lastly, I've got, I think I'll probably just uh, quite stop it here. This is uh, taken from that post-battle report that the Japanese undertook of, of, of uh, trying to understand why the, the conflict went the way that it went the way that it did. And this is actually showing the final night attack against number three airstrip. And this is the airstrip here. That's north. And you would have noticed that in my map, the airstrip is not at this angle, it's at that angle. Uh, because they were operating at night, because that no one had reliable maps. Quite simply, the Japanese never really knew where they were. That was taken from the hand-drawn map, drawn by survivors, by interviewing a number of survivors in the after battle, and they've got the orientation of a two kilometer long, 70 meter wide airstrip out by 90 degrees. I'm not saying to make fun of people, I'm saying that that's what happens when you fight in the darkness, when you don't have good information about where you are. Uh, and it also tells you that uh, no amount of torture is going to uh, convince local Republicans to help you. <laughs> Japanese land in the east, every time they go further west, they become less certain of where they are. Australians start out here in the west, every time they advance further east, their mapping gets less and less accurate. And they become less certain of where they are. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for putting up with me.